Hey everyone and welcome back to your weekly Linux and open source news show. Today we have a good one. We've got a roadmap from Nvidia on their future Waylon efforts and the stuff they'll never really bring to Linux because Waylon just doesn't support it. We've got some issues with Tuxedo drivers. A kernel developer is trying to block their drivers from accessing debugging symbols because there's a licensing issue in there. And we also have a big update to the XVK. We also have some more news about Ubuntu 25.04 and we have this message from our sponsor. It's me! I just wanted to tell you that if you enjoy these Linux news videos, you can get them in a daily format just by becoming a Patreon member or a YouTube member. Both of these start at one dollar or euro per month and you'll get a daily podcast five to ten minutes from Monday to Friday, which is what I base all of this weekly work on. So if that interests you, the link to get all of this is in the description. Anyway, now let's get on to the video. So Nvidia outlined their plans for Wayland support and the current issues with Wayland specifically, or at least the limitations of Nvidia drivers for Wayland. Currently, Wayland protocols do not support certain things that exist in the Nvidia drivers in their x.org version. And so Nvidia can't and won't implement them for Wayland. This includes SLI related things, so dual GPU setups where both your GPUs are plugged in into one another. Virtually no one uses that in a real day-to-day -day scenario. Some workstations might, uh, but in the consumer market, SLI has been abandoned a while back. There's also the NVIDIA settings panel. Plenty of settings in there just cannot be handled by the driver directly on Wayland, notably everything related to display configuration. So the NVIDIA settings app will never have feature parity uh, between Wayland and X11. Again, not necessarily a big deal because all of these options are available in your desktop environment settings anyway. Now what they do have planned for Wayland though, is multi-monitor variable refresh rate support, which is really nice. They'll also set a specific frame buffer parameter to fix some output issues and bugs that they have right now. But more importantly, they want to work on something they already talked about a while back, which is a display multiplexer to connect the discrete GPU to the built-in display or an external display without having to rely on the integrated GPU to pass that information through. Apparently, no Wayland compositor currently supports this, Hopefully this becomes a priority because hybrid laptops are everywhere these days and they kind of need this feature. They also want to add support for the color management pipeline that everyone has been working on, specifically KDE, it's the HDR support stuff, plus support for VDP AU, an open source video decoding library, and support for virtual GPU, uh, which is the ability to use a real physical GPU inside of multiple VMs, uh, notably useful for servers that handle many VMs and want to bring them graphical acceleration with just one card. I think it's a solid list of improvements and I don't think many people will lament what cannot be added to Wayland right now. Solid roadmap, hopefully they can accomplish this. The multiplexing thing is the most important in my opinion. It will solve a bunch of problems with hybrid laptops. So hopefully they get on that and Wayland compositors start implementing a way to support this properly as well. Now, a Linux kernel developer is taking issue with the way Tuxedo is handling their open source drivers. Tuxedo, if you don't know, and you probably do know them by now because I talk about them all the time, they are a regular sponsor of the channel, they are a PC reseller. They take popular models from uh, manufacturers like Tongfang and Clevo, they test them extensively under Linux, they pick the hardware that works best, and the parts that don't work as well as they'd like to, or not at all, they develop drivers for, and they ship that as GPL v3 open source drivers that anyone can use and package. And obviously they then sell these computers uh, to people with the drivers pre-installed in a version of a distro that they ship, whether it be Ubuntu, I think they also have OpenSUSE uh, or Kubuntu and their own version, which is Tuxedo OS. Their drivers are open source, they're licensed under the GPL v3, but the issue here is that the Linux kernel itself is GPL v2 and you cannot mix GPL v2 and v3 code together 
all that well because the GPL v3 adds more restriction on what you can do with the code and those restrictions would also apply to the GPL v2 code around it except the GPL v2 code is not supposed to have more restrictions than what the GPL v2 authorizes so basically it's a mess those licenses were kind of dumb and don't really work together and so you can't really mix both unless you go through a, a bunch of weird hoops in rewriting certain things. A kernel developer doesn't think that's right and they're creating a set of patches to prevent Tuxedo drivers from accessing the debugging symbols from the Linux kernel. He basically says that these drivers are kind of proprietary because they can't be included as is, which means that basically they are not as open source as Tuxedo wants to say. This is a technique that they implemented a while back with NVIDIA drivers as well to make sure that the drivers could not interact with GPL v2 code. Tuxedo then answered the problem, at least one of their developers did, it's Werner, it's someone I interviewed a while back in a special episode of my weekly news audio podcast. He said that unfortunately this issue cannot be solved overnight, he says that it's an honest mistake, they never really wanted to state that they are compatible with a version of the GPL that they are not compatible with and they are working on solving the issue. They are basically rewriting their entire driver repo to upstream all the drivers under the GPL v2. This work is also in a public GitHub repo. He says it's an honest mistake, they started working on the drivers, they didn't check on that module compatibility thing, some people contributed some code under the GPL v3 and under that module and they basically cannot relicense everything as is, there are some legal things to solve first. In the end, it is an annoying situation, for sure, you just picked a license that doesn't really work with the kernel license, it's kinda dumb and it's annoying and it would be better if anyone could grab those drivers, propose them for inclusion in the kernel, Tuxedo would probably do it themselves and there would be no problem. I also think that the Linux kernel developer reaction here is a bit exaggerated, calling these drivers proprietary when anyone can grab them, compile them as a module and ship them in an external repo, that's a bit much. Like Fedora, there is a copper repo that has the drivers, uh, they're probably also in the AUR and I'm pretty sure I saw an OpenSUSE repo that includes them as well. So they can be used and they're actually being used. Now, Ubuntu provided a roadmap for their next version, 25.04. Of course, it's planned for April next year because that's how Ubuntu releases work. And among the usual changes, like moving to the next GNOME version, GNOME 48 in this case, and the latest uh, Linux kernel version, not necessarily the stable one, uh, but the latest available version, even if it's not fully finalized, they will also refine their installer, notably to make creating a dual boot easier. They basically want to be clearer about the other installed operating systems when you try to install Ubuntu and they want to refine how you can free up some space and how you can replace an existing Ubuntu install. They also want to improve how they handle BitLocker encrypted Windows installs because right now they will just ask you to boot into Windows to turn BitLocker off and then to reinstall Ubuntu or to try to reinstall Ubuntu uh, because they cannot just support uh, decrypting this stuff. Apparently they will try and fix that. Their full disk encryption solution using the TPM chip of your computer is also moving forward nicely. They hope they'll be able to make the Nvidia drivers support this feature as well. Their security center will also gain the ability to handle the encryption password and PIN. Accessibility will be a focus as well. They have ordered a third-party audit on their desktop experience. They identified areas that need to improve like keyboard navigation, the screen reader, and high contrast mode. And they want to solve these things in this development cycle and collaborate with upstream communities. But they only cited uh, Yaru and Flutter, so I'm thinking they want to fix things in their own apps and they're gonna let GNOME developers fix their own accessibility stuff, which fortunately that's what they're doing in the GNOME 48 cycle with the Sovereign Tech Foundation projects. Hopefully uh, these improvements to the screen reader and to GNOME accessibility also land in GNOME 48. Ubuntu Core Desktop will also be moving along, this being their immutable distro based on snaps, and they're 
basically separating layers a bit more. Uh, they plan to have a snap for the kernel, a snap for the windowing server, a snap for certain drivers, a snap for the desktop environment, and snaps for each app. But they're also now uh, separating some core services like Pipewire into their own snaps as well, so the install can be more modular. Other changes in Ubuntu 25.04 will include replacing the old Evins PDF Reader by Papers. It's a new GNOME app that has the same feature set, but they are pretty much better implemented and better integrated with current Advaita guidelines. They will also improve the Firefox snap and add some fixes around Wayland and Nvidia. All in all, it is a solid list of features for this new version. And it's the version where they can take risks because it's not an LTS. They have a few versions to implement things, test things out. And it will only be interesting to you if you like the current Ubuntu ecosystem and their snaps and their own apps. I'm not the biggest fan of all of this, but I can at least appreciate how far this ecosystem has come. Ubuntu now offers a pretty good experience around all the snaps, the permissions you can have, and their own apps. I still prefer flat packs to snaps, but I can appreciate how solid it now is. Now this week we saw a big update to DXVK version 2.5. If you don't know yet, this library is used to translate DirectX 8, 9, 10, and 11 games into Vulkan games. All the instructions that these games rely upon are translated into Vulkan instructions that Linux can understand. The new version of DXVK brings a completely rewritten way of handling memory, which seems to result in a lot more VRAM being made available to games. Basically what it does is it defragments how the VRAM is used. It defragments the VRAM, which frequently returns a VRAM that was previously unusable to the game that you're playing. If you are familiar with old Windows file systems uh, that needed to be defragmented, that's the same thing. Basically, as you write stuff and remove stuff from the disk or from the RAM, you leave really small spaces that can be used to write fragments of the information you want, but then retrieving these fragments gets increasingly harder and harder because you have to remember where all of these fragments are, where they're located, and go fetch each of them one by one, which can have worse performance than just writing all of this information next to each other. So you have to defragment to put all of these little fragments next together. This feature will work better if your GPU drivers are relatively recent, so you need the Mesa 24 drivers or the Nvidia drivers 560, almost any distro that you would want to use for gaming should have access to that. This should result in less lockups in game and a bit better performance. There's also new stuff added like support for emulated cursors so games can set an image as the mouse cursor properly. Uh, there's Unreal Engine 3 games that should have been improved and work better. Some specific fixes for Command and Conquer Generals for Tomb Raider Legends or Rayman 3. And there should also be improvements for CPU bound games uh, that should gain more stability and more performance, especially in 32-bit games like Total War Rome 2 or Total War Warhammer 3. All in all, it is a big update to DXVK that should improve performance and stability for a lot of older titles and not necessarily older titles, because even recent games generally offer a DirectX 11 backend, because a lot of computers still cannot run DirectX 12 well, so DirectX 11 is still used in a lot of recent games, so having these features is nice for everyone. Now this week we also got some details from Valve on their recent work to fix annoying bugs and issues on the Steam client on Linux. They have a semi-technical blog post in which they say that the Linux APIs that they had to work with, specifically getOnv and setOnv, are some of the worst Linux APIs that exist. Uh, these are used to get the values of environment variables and to set environment variables as well. And apparently these are just not safe to use in multi-threaded environments. And so Valve wanted to minimize how much they relied on these things. Apparently using set env can crash a program outright or at least crash an entire thread. And so by removing most calls to these APIs, they've made the Steam client much more stable and reliable. These issues with those two APIs are being addressed in glibc, the basis for most C implementations on Linux. But for now, Valve wants to move around these APIs as much as they can because they are just not reliable for what they need to do. 
Valve also said that developing on Linux isn't the easiest thing because, for example, getting crash reports is not great. There is so much variance between distros, driver versions, window managers, subsystems, user customization, and other things that the reports simply cannot be exploited and grouped automatically as they could be on Windows, for example. Now, this is one of the big advantages of containerized application formats. Yes, I'm gonna be the flat pack shell here again, but this format solves these problems. If you use the flat pack version of an application, you have one unified environment in which you run this thing, and so all your bug reports will be the exact same and the same format and have the same kind of library information at the very least. It doesn't solve bad APIs or bad system calls but at least for the bug report things, it's solved. So Valve, enforce the flat pack. It's a, a good format to use. Now we have some interesting stuff coming to Proton Experimental this week, most notably support for NVIDIA Optical Flow and DLSS 3. The first one is an API that is used to do object tracking and it's used in conjunction with DLSS 3, which is a frame generation technology. So DLSS3 can basically create frames to simulate smoother gameplay on lower end computers. For example, your computer might only render the game at 45 FPS, but it's gonna be displayed at 60 because one frame every three frames is gonna be added on top and created by DLSS3. And these frames are created properly thanks to the optical flow API that does object tracking and makes sure that what is displayed in these frames is accurate. This does add a bit of latency for games, of course, but in a lot of games, you just wouldn't really care because you don't need split-second reflexes in every type of game that you play. All in all, what it means is that games that offer the option for DLSS 3 should play nice on Linux, which is good. Proton also fixed a lot of stuff for specific games like Star Wars Jedi Knight 2, Dragon Age The Veil Guard, Skull and Bones, or Rivals of Ether 2. Now that is pretty cool stuff and pretty encouraging too. If our platform can keep up with all of that work and all of these technologies in a reasonable manner, in a reasonable time frame, then I think we're gonna keep being a suitable gaming platform. And honestly, not many people are ever going to own a GPU capable of doing 4K ultra settings at 120 FPS, but you might be able to almost have that same experience by using a way cheaper GPU and using upscaling tech and frame generation tech to feel like it's 4K 60 or 4K 120 when it's actually not that. Speaking of boards and computers, why don't you check today's sponsor, Tuxedo? We talked about them a little bit ago. They make PCs uh, that run Linux out of the box. They have open source drivers, even though some kernel developers seem to think that these drivers aren't up to snuff, you still absolutely can get their Tuxedo computers. I do. I run this entire channel, all the videos that I make, all the podcasts that I make on a Tuxedo computer running their OS, Tuxedo OS. I do all my gaming, on one of their desktops. It's a Tuxedo Cube. It's sitting right under this uh, little desk here. And it's great. They have choices for everyone. They have a lot of options for the hardware. You can install virtually every distro you want. And if there are some small issues, all the drivers are there. They are compiled in a lot of repos for a lot of distros. So go check them out. Click the link in the description. See what they have to offer. They're really, really good. And I've only been using what they sell for more than a year now. And they've been a sponsor of the channel for like two or three years by now, uh, which tells you everything you need to know about them. They're reliable and they're really good. Anyway, thank you all for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. You have all the usual buttons to click. Uh, please do that. Like, subscribe, notification bell, comments, whatever. You know how this algorithm thingy works. And if you really enjoy the channel and what I do here, well, you can support me financially, but I talked about that at the beginning of the video. So thank you all for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one next week. Bye.